This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The information presented on this program is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult an appropriate professional for guidance about your concerns. What is Chalkboard Chat? It's an MPB education podcast. It's a variety show providing information and resources for teachers, students, parents, guardians, and everyday people on various topics. It's learning something new with every publication. Chalkboard Chat. Find the podcast or listen from chalkboardchat.mpbonline.org. From MPB Think Radio, this is Now You're Talking. It's a show about the most interesting people and stories of Mississippi. Hey, I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey. I'm editor-at-large and cartoonist with Mississippi Today. A pediatric neurosurgeon, Dr. Jay Wellens, has been in practice for 21 years. Of course, that doesn't include training. Add a few more years on top of that. He was born and raised in southern Mississippi, Columbia, to be exact. Uh, Dr. Wellens' passion for healing has led him from the University of Mississippi Medical School here in Jackson. Uh, he went to Duke University, went to UAB. He's now uh, in head of pediatric neurosurgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And Dr. Wellens, he's here today to discuss his new book, All That Moves Us, a pediatric neurosurgeon, his young patients and their stories of grace and resilience. Um, and of course, growing up here in Mississippi as well. And I will say this, uh, a quick book review on there, because I just gotten done with the Mississippi Book Festival. As you know, our guests last week were the two authors that were part of the panel that I was on. So I had a bunch of reading to do to get ready for that and so forth. And then I realized, well, you know, I really probably ought to read Dr. Wallen's book before I talk to him about it. So I pick it up and I don't put it down. It's that good. And, you know, I can tell you this, that it is a book that, and okay, first of all, for those those of you who've ever been through surgery and you've ever like dealt with surgeons before, most surgeons you would not think would be able to sit down and write a book that would make you want to not put it down like this book, but it is absolutely fantastic. I give it five stars out of five stars. Um, it is that good of a book. And so I just say, go out and get it right now. So Dr. Wons, I don't know if I can possibly build you up any more than I just did, <laughs> but congratulations. Marshall, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all that you just said, and I'm so honored to be on the show today. So Man, it's great. I'm glad for you to be able to kind of get a little Mississippi homecoming and uh, be able to talk to your people, because it's kind of fun. When I, I was telling some of my friends up at UMMC that I was going to be talking to you, and they're like, oh, yeah, he was in the class ahead of me, but he hung out with all the cool kids. <laughs> That might be the first time anybody's ever said that about me, so I will take that. <laughs> yeah, that was that was Doctor Doctor Doug Harkins that said that one. So, nice, uh, nice. well, yeah. I appreciate that. Pass it on that I appreciate the uh, the credit. Yeah. I will do that. Uh, Mike McMullen, who's up there too, he was he was telling me he's like, oh, you've read the book, it is so good. So yeah, you've got a lot of fans already here, but it's just nice to talk to you. And like I said, thank you for the book. It is. Um, very refreshing, and I think very important to read it right now after what we've been through the last couple of years. Just yeah. before we get too deep into you growing up here in Mississippi, what what prompted you to sit down and write a book? Well, um, I, you know, have just I've had the opportunity to reflect, and that's something that we don't often have. Um, I talk about it a little bit in the book, and uh, but um, basically, I was kind of going Mach nine. Uh, in a full-fledged academic, you know, neurosurgery practice with different hats that I wore for research and education as well as the clinical work. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, rather than me telling uh, parents about uh, a tumor and showing it to them on a computer screen or in the old days back on the light box when you put used to put films up, it was me hearing about it. And uh, I had a, a tumor down kind of deep in the muscle of my leg top of my leg, and um, it was kind of thought to be malignant before it uh, was found out to be benign, and so I kind of had the full-on existential threat, uh, and then I had surgery to have it taken out, and I basically went from Mach 9 to, to being still for two months while the, the whole thing had to heal and I had to learn how to walk again. Um, so it was really that opportunity to just completely become still, um, that that allowed me the ability to kind of reflect back over the, you know, the nearly two decades at that time of my practice and the, 
kind of what got me into medicine and my time in medical school there in Mississippi and how important that was to me and my residency up at Duke and even the first 10 years of my practice over at UAB. Just uh, It was just a really important time. You know, there's only so much Netflix you can watch, Marshall, you know, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, the opportunity to kind of sit down and jot some stories down and go back over notes that I'd taken previously, it just... Um, it just ended up being transformative to me. I definitely want to get into some of the stories and deep dive into them because they're incredibly moving too. And some of them are incredibly sad. I, I completely get about the being still thing. Number one, I've heard the three where I had a melanoma a few years ago. So oh, that was, yeah. yeah and it, it's, it's like literally you hear Charlie Brown's parents when you're hearing it, you're hearing want, 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 want yeah. cancer, want, want, yeah. want. And you're like, what? Yeah. The good yeah. news on your tumor was that it was benign, which is like a yep. one in a million chance that it could be benign. And what a gift that turned out to be. I mean, absolutely. And it just, you know, I I just, um, you know, once it was out and all the, the muscle that came out around it and the, the time it took to heal, you know, I, I remember talking to my friend, the pathologist, and I was like, show me how this is benign. You know, show me yeah. how it matches these the stains and the pictures in the book, because literally it was a one in a million chance. And so that's just, you know, that's just, that's just a big time for reflection. You know, we've gone from the big up to the big down, you know, yeah. back up again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I got hit by the pandemic and double uh, fusion spinal surgery all at the same time. So I had a lot of time to be down and I don't yeah. know about you, but not moving around and not move that just about drove me absolutely crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, you know, particularly, I think, um, or folks like us who are used to, you know, to moving fast, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, the, you just, you, you survive in the current of the water. That's how you, that's how you breathe almost like, you know, like yeah. sharks or some yeah. other fish that just, you know, require movement to, to stay going. I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, running several research programs and being the program director for the residents and, and having a busy clinical service and yeah. the administrative roles. I mean, it was just, you know, Mach 9. And so all of a sudden, you just went from that to being still. And, um, you know, in, in reflection, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to write a couple of pieces that came out in the New York Times, and then from that, you know, came came the book and some other pieces. I mean, you know, you, you just don't know how things are going to turn out or why things are happening like they are. But my goodness, what an important time for me to be still. You know, well, then. I'm grateful that you put it to good use. Like I said, Netflix is pretty awesome, but yeah, you do run out of things to watch on that. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. What was that ad used to be a few years ago? Like, I've come to the end of the internet. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right, I right. I'm like, I think I've already seen this episode two of Lost in Space. I think I need, to, I think I need to do something different. <laughs> I know it's like I like watching Batman. When it's like, well, that was good when I was a kid. What happened to it? You know, you're on that too. <laughs> You grew, you grew up here. I mean, you grew up in Mississippi. Your dad, your dad, and I tell you what, I really want to do a deep dive on your dad for a couple of reasons. When you wrote about him, um, just to kind of give you a little bit of my background real quick, because that's not what this show's about, but my brother-in-law died of ALS and my father had dementia. So I had a very similar arc um, than you yeah. did on that. So I had complete empathy when I read that and I had to put the book down and kind of walk out and go sit out on the porch for a few minutes. Um, your dad was the kind of guy that I would have loved to meet. Uh, a lot of people here in Mississippi knew him most likely, uh, obviously with his role, um, in, in the guard and, and with the air force. Uh, he was just a, a great guy and he was a good dad. He really wanted to be a doctor, but never got to be one. Yes. And, uh, you know, he, you know, my dad kind of had this dual life uh, in a good way, and I mean that. Um, oh, it's so not like he had a family somewhere, yeah, you know, three towns over? Family. Okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah, over in Brookhaven, maybe. Yeah. But, uh, but um, no, I mean, he just, when he, you know, he he worked for his father in Wellens Cleaners that was the big dry cleaners there in Jackson for many years until it uh, burnt down. And um, but uh, But, you know, he made a silver dollar a week, and he saved it up as a kid, and then when he turned 15, he, you know, he bought a or 16 he bought a piper cub uh, wow. and he just it just began his love for flying and so from that into the military and transitioning into the guard and, and the air national guard and you know everywhere his job took him uh he was involved with the guard doesn't matter if it was he was with west virginia pulp and paper company up in mechanicville new york or over in um, tuscaloosa alabama and then finally back to jackson and and then to columbia and, and then at the same time as 
you know, he lived this really robust uh, kind of work life where he, he was, um, you know, with West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company, he helped negotiate between uh, unions and corporate. And, you know, my, my mom, who had passed away a few years ago, she she just kept just so much information about the family. And so the ability that I could go back through and see the records of his time in the Guard and see the records of his time, you know, negotiating and, you know, seeing the letter thanking him from the unions and thanking him from, you know, corporate for the work that he did. Uh, it was just, it was really neat. It was like, like a little time capsule opened. But he was an enabler, Marshall, in the best possible way. I mean, he he was the kind of person that um, that helped people find out what they wanted to do and then was able to help move them in that direction. And it was just remarkable to see. And he had this experience where he worked with a family medicine doctor, and he just loved it. He just had shadowed him. It was in the midst of his kind of uh, time that he was considering going to back to medical school. And so, you know, the family medicine doctor even gave him a stethoscope with his name on it and just said, you're going to make a fine doctor one day. And, you know, he went back even with two young kids and he took a couple of classes to get the pre-med stuff done. And he took the MCAT and he scored well and he got in and he just couldn't find the money to do it by that time. His dad's cleaners had burnt down. There wasn't family money to use. There wasn't scholarships and financial aid then like there was now. And, you know, again, I've seen the letters, you know, just kind of asking, you know, uh, we'll pay this back and just not able to get it. And so finally he kind of let that dream go and he and he moved fully on into the medical, into the, into the uh, business world and into the guard. And he just had these, these two kind of parallel, really awesome careers that he – had the opportunity to influence people. But that was, I think, always something that was um, uh, an uncompleted dream for him. You were a third child. Was there huge expectations of you living his dream? I mean, I, you know, my dad, he kind of wanted me to take over the family business. I never did. I became a cartoonist, which it, it kind of befuddled him a little bit, but he was pretty proud of me. What was yeah. what were your expectations growing up as a kid? I think, I think the expectations for me was to do something that helped people. Uh, that's what my family, you know, my mom was. I think you nailed very, it. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah my, my mom was very much involved with uh, the Mississippi Episcopal Church, and that was just a very important, um, important, uh, you know, uh, spirituality was important to her and it manifested in a way that, you know, helped uh, children or, or children at risk or families. And, and then, you know, just seeing how my both of them kind of moved through this life, you know, knowing that we were blessed with a with a tight family and and um, you know with a good life. And I think this concept that we need to do what we can for others to kind of help pass it on. So I think that was the overarching, um, uh, you know, feeling. You know, I, I did joke with my dad when he was alive that. You know, I felt like sometimes he would come into my room at night and whisper medicine into my ear when I was asleep. <laughs> you know, I bet but he, he did. You know, he did not whisper neurosurgery. That was all me. You know, that that all happened in medical school. But um, so, sure, I think there's some there's some of that. But also, you know, I made the conscious decision. I mean, I was an English major at Ole Miss, and I see. Yeah, okay. Let's back up for a second. Yeah, That's not your yeah. normal route into neurosurgery. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah. It's okay, not. usually biology, maybe, but. I mean, seriously, was was that you fighting your destiny at that point? I think a little bit. I, I think, you know, I, I really was drawn to, um, uh, you know, authors and creativity. And I, I really. Um, you got both sides of the brain going there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both left and right brain for sure. But I, I, you know, I just felt like that there's so many, you know, uh, just so many Southern writers. And we had this yeah. plethora of writers at the time that were that, at um, Mississippi and uh, University of Mississippi that were just amazing teachers. And between creative writing and also just Anglo-Irish literature and the Romantic era of British literature, I mean, you've you've got this whole host of people that have moved through life and they've written about it. And so kind of to go back and study what their thoughts on, that, that was really interesting to me. But I did... I did kind of have this moment where, you know, I, I enjoy the writing of William Carlos Williams, of Farrell Sams, of, you know, um, uh, you know, other uh, writers, Chekhov, you know, that were medical writers. Um, and uh, and I just said, you know, maybe going into 
medicine. I can learn more about the human condition. You know, I can be a family medicine doctor in South Mississippi, get paid in, you know, poultry and <laughs> fruit and, you know, and, and rich produce and, and be happy, just like the people that I shadowed when I was growing up in a small town. Yeah. You know, the people that rounded in the nursing homes and people that, you know, roll up your sleeves and bowl some towels. There's We're going to have a baby soon, you know, that kind of stuff. And that was that was kind of my goal, Yeah. Yeah, and you you decided to do it in steroids. You did have Barry <laughs> Hanna and Ellen Douglas as your teachers, and uh, you did get a B minus from Barry Hanna, which congratulations on that one. And um, <laughs> and I think the statute of limitations is passed on this, so I don't think that Ole Miss is going to come take your degree away from you. But you did turn in the same papers to both teachers. That, I, did. I did. Okay, so <laughs> you're my hero. That that was pretty smart on your part. <laughs> Well, I had I had Barry Hanna one semester, and I had Ellen Douglas the very next. And, you know, I, I wanted his take on them, and then I thought it was appropriate, you know, as a writer at the time, a college writer, to say, you know, I wonder what Miss Douglas would say. Ah, yeah, that sounds – That's I like that explanation. That's a lot better. I just didn't feel like writing another another story. So, <laughs> yeah, there's some, there was some of that. Too. Okay, well, very good. <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, something stuck. Um, you're a fantastic writer. Uh, there was – you. you know, and like I said, I'm going to get you to tell the stories here in a little bit, uh, or at least a couple of them. But, it, you know, there's so much humanity in the way you write. You kind of stumbled into actually writing. Um, your first uh, article, I think, was in the New York Times. And if I remember correctly, involved a really bad nosebleed on that. But that kind of lit a fire under you, didn't it? It did. It did. It was, um, you know, it was my sister, Sarah, my middle sister, is older than me. She said, you know, you should think about writing some of those stories that you you've been telling us around the dining room table, you know, for years and years. And, um, and so I did, you know, I had this experience where I was going up to Vermont to be visiting professor where you go up and you have a dinner and then you give a academic lecture. I was going to talk about fetal neurosurgery and then meet the residents and, and then you come back and I just got tired of, of, of packing too much. You know, I just, as the boy scout in me that was like, well, maybe I need brown shoes and black shoes. You know, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to carry a small bag. I'm going to wear my suit and I'm going to go up, have the dinner, do the talk the next day and come home. And, uh, it was about an hour into the flight up to, up to, um, Burlington when, you know, the boom, the little thing goes off overhead and they're like, is there a doctor on board? And so I stand up and I'm thinking, you know, it's going to be somebody having chest pain or somebody maybe having stroke symptoms. And I'll walk back to the plane, and it's a guy sitting there with a like a grapefruit-sized wad of just soaked, bloody tissues that nice. he's holding there in front of his nose. Yeah. And I will admit that the first thing I thought of was like, man, this is my only suit, <laughs> my only clothes for the next 24 hours. But but basically, um, you know, there was a terrific nurse practitioner, a young woman on the flight, and she and I both responded and. You know, he had the guy had a nosebleed. His blood pressure was up a little bit. He'd had some vodka that can all precipitate it, and pinching the nose like you learn in Boy Scouts didn't make a difference. I mean, it was like a faucet had been turned on, and so I'd asked for some Afrin, and the nurse practitioner said, "Into tampon," and I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's so brilliant!" And so we asked the flight attendant to call overhead for tampons. And I mean, is the moment that she did, it was like boom, 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 boom. Like people just it lit up, like you'd see on an old timey, you know, dashboard thing, you know, telephone control. So, like she basically, the flight attendant took the basket that you put pretzels in, and you know, you you pull that. She dumped it on the floor, and she walked and she gathered up all the all the things that people that the women had offered. And by the time they got back to us. That basket had small, medium, large tampons. It had wings, things without wings. It had so many options <laughs> for us to use. And we basically figured out we put Afrin on the tip of one of the tampons and we just put it into an orifice that it was not designed to go Tell in. me he had the strings hanging out of his nose. He did. He oh. had them hanging out of his nose. Yeah, both sides. But it stopped. And, yeah. uh, and we and we landed and the, you know, the... The, the paramedics kind of made fun of us for an emergency nosebleed. But when they saw the amount of blood, I think they kind of were like, okay, well, this makes sense. But, um, but yeah, that came out, and and that really, you know, I got a lot of good kind of fun emails from people saying, hey, that's a funny story. You know, that's a really good story. But this is this is the cool thing to me is that my editor at the time, at times is a guy named uh, Peter uh, Capiano, and Peter – or Catapano, sorry. And Peter um, is known, I didn't know this at the time, but Peter is known to 
kind of be a person who facilitates new writers. And so he said, hey, you know, you're a pediatric neurosurgeon. I know you have some serious stories to tell. Why don't you tell one of those? And so that's when the second piece came out. Um, Dr. Williams, you mind if I say Jay? I always feel nervous about no, yeah, talking to doctors. Yeah, the only yeah. doctors I call by their first name are the ones I run with. And so um, and usually <laughs> well, that. I always, I always think about Steve Martin on uh, Saturday Night Live when he says, oh, no, no, don't call me Mr. Martin. Call me Mr. Steve Martin. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, Jay is fine. Yeah. No, it's really funny. I was like, I was running. We were doing the, um, I guess the Flying Pig Marathon up in Cincinnati, and uh, two of my friends are cardiologists, so we're running along. And I said, "You do realize if I fall out, you can save me, and if you fall out, I can draw a funny picture about it." And <laughs> I don't think they've ever wanted to run with me ever since then. <laughs> so well, let's let's go back a little bit. You you get into medical school, you go into there, and your path in neurosurgery was is pretty cool actually because it was just a series of different things that you experienced along the way uh, you like kids and then how you got I mean, and also too there just aren't many of you in the world yeah that's right there are uh, around 250 pediatric neurosurgeons in north america um and uh, that that's um you know uh, united states and canada uh and so it's a small group uh, the proportion that are women are around 30 percent, and that proportion may be oh, it should be going should be hitting 40 percent pretty soon, as soon as the uh, you know there's all kind of boards and stuff you have to take. But um, it's just uh, it's a really good field. I mean, I think we all get along because we, for the most part, we all get along because you know we deal with this very similar situations no matter where you are, you know, parents that are so grateful for, you know, what, what you've been able to do. And then, you know, parents who never, ever want to see you again. Um, so it's a, it's an emotional metronome, uh, honestly. And so I think the, uh, when we get together at our national meetings or at, um, you know, research meetings or so forth, I think, um, there's just a lot of commonality that we all have a lot of common experience. I thought about that when you said you wanted to do something with your hands when you're in medical school. And, and I thought about your dad, you know, here he is, he's got ALS and he can barely, he's your best man, which I'm so thankful he got to be your best man yeah. for your wedding. And um, uh, when he's sitting there, not hardly able to get the ring out of his pocket because he's losing control of your hands. And I know, you know, when you're sitting there and somebody comes up and shakes your hand too hard, you're like, whoa, no, <laughs> Back off. I need those, you know, and I mean, it, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I just for some reason, I related the two things when I was reading that, how powerful that was. Um, well, you know, it's it's um, not lost on me that the field that ultimately uh, went into, um, you know, this is a ALS is a neurologic yeah. disorder in which there's not really any operation for, you know, and as you can imagine as a fourth year medical student, you know, I'm pouring over my medical texts, you know, I'm just... I feel so, you know, inadequately or ill prepared to, yeah. you know, to understand what else to do. But, but you know, I mean, it was sad, and uh, you know, there's nothing anywhere. It doesn't matter what our faith constructs are, uh, that says that we're immune to suffering or that we're immune to grief. You know, it's, it's just the the opportunity to look back on it. You know, nearly 25 years later, and see what how that had an impact on me. You know, I, I saw, you know, my father in the patients that I cared for, yeah. it doesn't matter the age. And I saw myself in the grief that the family had. So it, it, um, it definitely, um, you know, imparted on me uh, a substantial influence that I've, I've, I've you know, in, in, in reflection has kept, stayed with me. One the, yeah, one of the things, Jay, to be honest with you, that was not lost on me in the book. And like I said, I've I've been on both sides of it as a parent, you know, with my child yeah. needing surgery, and I've been on it with me needing surgery. I would rather have literally surgery than have my child have a cold. And I think every parent agrees with that. And, you know, and I've dealt with a lot of medical professionals, and some of them have bedside manners, some of them don't. That's just the way the world is. You have got a really good balance of empathy because there was like one case where, you know, you had to get the child into surgery immediately. The parents wanted to give you the long version of the story, and you were yeah. able, able to shut them down in a very polite and kind way, in a loving way, whereas you could have just blew them off. Is that something that, I mean, do you develop over time? Because like I said, you're dealing with people who are literally going through the worst moment possible in their lives. Their child is sick. Yeah. No, that's exactly right, Marshall. I mean, you know, like 
it is one of the worst moments of their lives, you know, if not the worst, because of, I mean, I completely agree with you what you said. I'd rather have surgery than have my child have to go through any illness. And so, you know, that is a common, right there, a common theme. And so then all of a sudden when you're talking to somebody about the need for an emergent surgery to take a blood clot out or to, you know, to to help the you know, a paral- issue with paralysis if there's a blood clot in the spinal cord or, you know, whatever the issue is, if there's a brain tumor, if there's a, a bleed in the brain that's because of a vascular malformation. You know, these are just incredibly challenging conversations, and, and you know that you're just kind of unleashing, you know, a great deal of grief uh, onto the family. But at the same time, uh, and I talk about this a little bit in a piece uh, called Conversations uh, that I didn't really realize it until – you know, years later when when the, the mom told me. But, you know, you, you really are also providing, you know, there is peace with a plan. Yeah. Uh, you know, my, and my good friend and chairman, Reed Thompson, uh, here at Vanderbilt, you know, kind of coined that term, peace with a plan. But, you know, you, you take this sense of chaos and what's going on, and we know something that's wrong. We know something's wrong with our child, and then you're able to name it. And then you're able to say, this is what our next step is. And and then, then there's a piece I wrote in there called Rubber Bands where – and sometimes you're able just to kind of see this hazy version of a life to be lived. You know, like if we can just move through this and get to the other side of this, then, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, really hopeful that we'll be able to get your child back to you in in a way that is – that is is very meaningful. I mean, a very meaningful existence. And so, yeah, I mean, you, 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 there's a balance. You know, I, I, I talk a little bit about um, this first time where I, you know, a child had had a terrible accident, and the dad had kind of brought him brought him in in his arms, and and I was trying to check all the boxes and get into the OR, and I looked down, and you know, there's some brain on the dad's cuff of his pants. And oh wow! It's a very graphic image, but you know, I just had this realization like, you know, I can't imagine what this man's going through. And so you have to acknowledge the humanity. There's just a necessary empathy. But at the same time, whether or not you're a parent or not, you have to almost disengage it like by pushing in a clutch so that you can move forward. You know, I, there's this wonderful couple here that uh, I first met when their infant child had a ruptured brain aneurysm and they were resuscitated twice. You know, in the 30 minutes before, the child had died and come back and died and come back. And basically it was the recognition that this thing had blown inside the baby's brain and they needed to get to the OR. And I think the family was tired and they just said, all right, well, you know, let's sit down here and talk about what the plans are. And I, I remember just telling them, I said, look, guys, this is not a sit-down conversation. Like, we have to go to the OR now. I promise I will listen to the story. I promise. But I have to go right now if we're going to save her life. And I think, you know, the ability to to acknowledge that this is a terrible time, to just say, I am going to listen to you more, I promise it is important to me. Yeah. You know, but right now the information that I need is and that, that we need, that me, my partners, pediatric neurosurgeons across the country, anybody that deals with something emergent, like we have a patient, we have a plan, and we need to go to the OR and do what we can to save life and save limb. Yeah, I, there are some a couple of things. Number one, the fact that you can compartmentalize so well and you can make snap decisions in the face of chaos. When I think a lot, and the fact too that you can handle when I mean you deal with a terrible disappointment. And I think you described it as you've got in your mind like a, a green field where yeah. you literally dig a hole and you put that disappointment in there and you bury it so that you can continue on because you can't allow your losses, because there's, there's obviously a lot of successes and you get the wedding invitations from the children that survive, which are incredible, but, but there are going to be times when you can't save the day and you can't allow those to hold you back. And when you need to save the next child. Yeah, that's exactly right, Marshall. And I do. I mean, I, I, there's a a French surgeon who, who coins it in, you know, years ago as every surgeon has a cemetery that they visit from time to time. And, And I would you know, I didn't even know that existed until after I actually wrote, you know, the book or, or had this concept over the last two decades. Because, you know, for me, it's just outside of my vision. Like, I can, 
look off to the left in my visual field and I feel like I can see that green field there. And, you know, I just take the memory of something that was sad or something that was hard or something that didn't turn out the way that we wanted to. And, you know, you just kind of take that memory and you put it in a box and you lock the box and you take the sod off the top and you bury that and you put it back down. And it's not like you bury it because you don't want to acknowledge the fact that it was somebody's loved one or it's just you you put it there so that you can honor it so that you know that it's there uh, and you know that it's had an impact on you but then it's then you move just like you were saying you move back into life into this place where you can continue to move forward and you know I had mentors in the past just when I was a resident you know help redirect me when I was kind of paralyzed from this kind of like grief this first experience with death and just say you know there is somebody that is waiting on you to help them and you need to move forward and help them and you and then there's another person and another person and another person and so you you honor the people that didn't make it you honor the situations that didn't turn out like they wanted to and you carry them with you in this place but but you also move forward and help the next person and the next person and the next person and that that's important, and that's important to me to be part of that kind of environment. You know, my, my division here with my partners here, and, you know, I know it's recreated at centers that have pediatric neurosurgeons and other acute care surgeons around the country and around the world. You know, it is about doing what you can, carrying that empathy with you, and then and then moving forward to help the next person. Uh, not to jump around too much, I just got a text from a gentleman named, well, he's Brigadier General Maxie Phillips, who was at the National Guard. And he said to say, yes, I knew him very well, talking about your dad. He's He had yeah. been a pilot in the 172nd Air Guard in Jackson and took command of the Meridian F-4 Unit 186 in the early 80s. Since he had never flown the Phantom, I was assigned as his instructor pilot to give him a home station checkout. I really enjoyed flying and working with him. We had some memorable times together and some cross-country flights. Please give him my regards to his son. John was an unforgettable character. You would have liked him, Maxie. Oh, what a wonderful thing to hear. I remember the name Maxie Phillips over and over and over again when I when I was growing up. That is so wonderful to hear. So I think you said I think you said he retired as a general. So General Phillips, if you're listening, thank you, sir. I'm honored. Yeah, I'll make sure. He, I think he probably is because he does listen to the show, but I'll make sure that, that he gets that message. So I just thought I'd pass that along. You. Um, you talked a little bit about the second story. And, of course, it's one of those cases where um, – and, and that's the thing, obviously – you went through medical school, you're a neurosurgeon, you're brilliant, okay? Um, but that said, the fact that you were able to make this snap decision in a second saved a life, the young lady was in Auburn, you were in Birmingham. It was yeah. a day like we're having here in Mississippi where it was pouring the rain, the storming, and everything else. They couldn't get the life flight helicopter going. Tell us that story. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm in my first month of being a, a, a new attending surgeon, you know, I've been a resident for six years, a fellow for a year. That's all after medical school. So it's like over a decade of training. So finally, you know, I'm on call on the weekend. Um, the weather's terrible. Um, I, uh, you know, go around on the patients, I take my cup of coffee and put it on the desk and put my feet up and I get called from an outside doctor um, down near Auburn saying, I've got a, you know, a, a girl, a 10-year-old, 9-year-old, I think, with uh, blood clot on pushing on the brain. She's about an hour and a half out from her accident because they had to extract her, and the helicopters aren't running. So she's 90 minutes from you by ground. And you know, there's a short period of time that you have it's to to kind of intervene. And then if you can't get things done acutely, then oftentimes it's it's you know, patient may not, the person may not survive. And her pupil was blown. She was not moving one side. All of those are signs of acute brain herniation where the brain's starting to swell from this blood clot that's pushing on it. And, um, you know, the ER doctor and I are kind of talking and trying to figure stuff out. And I looked down on my desk, and there's a picture on my desk uh, of my dad um, standing next to his F4, you know, in a flight suit, uh, you know, holding his flight helmet. Uh, and, you know, I think back to when I was a kid, you know, and he, he and I used to go flying together a bunch, and, you know, we would be up there, and I would be flying. I mean, I'm, you know, if I was like nine or ten myself at the time, and he would just barely feather the props or, or 
you know, just change the flaps a little bit, and we'd start to lose airspeed. And he would expect me to be able to work the problem, and um, and he kind of taught me how to, you know, kind of do checklist type behavior and work the problem. All right, this is not working. You know, it's like Tom Wolf. I've tried A, A's not working. Let's try B. B's not working. You know, and the right stuff. And so that had a big impact on me as a young boy. You know, checklist and problem solving. And so. I'm sitting there on the phone with this ER doc, and I'm looking at this picture of my dad, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking at his military outfit, and I say, you know, are those those Blackhawks still flying down there? Because if the Blackhawks are flying, and the ER doc said, oh, it's brilliant. If they'll fly in anything, I'll call them. And, and so uh, basically, literally like 20 minutes later, uh, you know, I'm sitting at my desk, and uh, and the coffee cup starts to – you know, ripple like you see in Jurassic Park, you know, boom, boom, except this is like thump, 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 thump. And I look up at the window that over that overlooks the front street at the Children's Hospital in Birmingham, and the window pane starts to thunk, thunk, thunk. Then my whole office is, is that. It's just overpowered with this rotor wash. And I look down, and there's wind and rain. It's blowing down the street, and trash cans are blowing down the street. Those dually trucks are getting pushed down on their shocks. And I look up, and there's a Black Hawk. Basically, it's hovering over the children's hospital, and they brought that girl. And so I go down to the ER, and, uh, you know, there's two of the soldiers there that brought her. They're drenched. They're just absolutely dripping with water. And they're, you know, one, two, three, move her over into the trauma bay, and everybody's starting to get her stabilized or starting that process to get her to the OR. And, you know, one of the nurses says, hey, Dr. Wellens, your patient's here. And, I, and the, the younger of the two soldiers must have heard to deliver him to Dr. Wellens, and he snapped to attention. And I said, look, at ease, soldier, we, you know, we should be saluting you. Like, you know, you guys have saved this girl's life. So, you know, basically her name was Jensen. Basically we got Jensen up to the OR, and we did the craniotomy and took the blood clot out and got everything fixed up. And then, you know, it's just that moment. Um, you just have it hundreds and hundreds of times over the course of a career where you're standing next to the patient as they wake up and you're saying, you know, squeeze your hands or open your eyes or what is your name, you know, to see if they're waking up or getting better. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, her eyes open and, you know, you realize that she's that she's going to make it. And then, you know, it, she, you know, she had a tough road, but at every time I would see her, there was some milestone that would be, you know, she would passed, you know, whether it was, walking or speaking again and going to rehabilitation and then after that I'd see her in clinic and you know and then it was she back in school and then it was made the dean's list and then it was uh, she's the school mascot or then it was one of 4-H pageant you know and and then all of a sudden over those six months to years to years I don't need to see her in clinic anymore and so her parents would keep sending me clippings of things that she had done and then it was she'd graduated from high school and then it was she's going to graduate she's going to college going to graduate school and then one day years later you know I'm in a different city in a different job and I get an invitation to her wedding and she tells me how grateful she is for the the Black Hawk pilots and soldiers for the ER doc for all the people at both hospitals you know who were able to kind of work the problem and figure out how to get her there and for, for me and and it was just a a remarkable moment and I realized how grateful I was for Jensen because that was early in my career when you're learning how to push, how hard to push, what to expect, you know, how to you know, how to start how to problem solve and I realized what an impact her outcome had on me over all those years and how many other children benefited from the fact that she just kept walking it down, walking it back. And so, you know, it was a remarkable thing, Marshall. And I have to tell you that as a coda or a follow-up to that story, uh, I um, was at uh, Square Books in Oxford about uh, three, three and a half, four weeks ago, and uh, was doing a, a reading there uh, of the book, a discussion and a reading. And I looked up, and Jensen was there. Oh no way! I was uh, and her husband, and uh, and so I pivoted immediately to saying, "All right, I'm going to do a reading, but I'm going to read." this story. And so I started reading that story. And Marshall, it's the first time I'd read it in front of Jensen. And I got about three quarters through it. And I started getting emotional. And everybody in the store was like, well, I mean, he wrote the thing. What's he getting emotional for? You know, and I was like, I'm going to tell you why I'm emotional here in just a minute. And then I finished reading it. And then I introduced Jensen. It was just a really, 
it was just a really amazing moment. It was just really neat. That's truly amazing. We're talking, of course, with Dr. Jay Wellens. The new book is All That Moves Us, a pediatric neurosurgeon, his young patients, and their stories of grace and resilience. And I think resilience is a good place to jump into this segment because the one thing, and I think that makes the book so good, well, there's a lot of reasons. Number one, part of the story is just kind of like you're watching something like ER. You know, you're getting the medical side of it. You're learning. I mean, I probably nor, I now actually understand my spinal fusion. I didn't probably before, but I do now after reading your book. Thank you very much. Um, but also, too, you understand that, number one, children are incredibly resilient, um, probably more so than we adults. And, of course, they've got, you know, neuroplasticity on their side, I suppose, and having yeah. r- really uh, so forth. But I think that was kind of the golden thread that ran through a lot of the stories was just how incredibly wonderfully resilient that kids are. Yeah, they are absolutely resilient. And I tell you, the other thing that's interesting uh, about pediatric neurosurgery is, um, you know, you think about anatomy being three dimensional. Um, You know, you think about the relationship of the nerves to the blood vessels, to the the rest of the body. And uh, I will tell you that the anatomy of a premature child, uh, you know, or a newborn even, is different than the anatomy of an 18-year-old. And so I always kind of talk about uh, time being the fourth dimension of anatomy. And so, uh, you know, there is something about the body that's still developing. I mean, the reason why infants don't walk is because the nerves aren't and the brain's not fully myelinated yet. That still has to happen. Uh, and so there's just a, a lot that's still developing. And I will tell you that of, of all the things that I have learned from the kids over the years, this issue of how resilient um, children are just stands very, very tall for me. Yeah, it was amazing. And I think just reading it, it kind of, because we're going through a tough time right now. I think we all, everybody's lost something, it seems like, in the last two years, and we're all trying to figure out. And I was just thinking, if a kid can literally go from, you know, a gunshot wound to being able to recover um, and to be able, you know, even though their life may not be the same. Yeah, yeah. That just, well, you know, and that's very inspiring that you can be 100% of what you are. Well, it's just, you know, I mean, the the topic of gunshot wounds, um, you know, is one that I could talk about for some time. And, yeah, no, you but, you get to see the worst of the worst. Yeah, get to see the worst of the worst, and I've 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 been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to talk about that a little bit in a in a in a recent piece that came out in Time Magazine. But at the end of the day, you know, our job is to take care of the kids that come and do what we can. And yeah. you know, uh, there's a boy I, I write about in here named KJ, and KJ was very young, two or three, when this first happened, but. You know, basically the bullet that uh, was, it was a handgun, it was found, it was an accidental shooting, and it it went, you know, through his skull and the frontal lobe and, and came out, and it actually went out as opposed to in. And so the issue, you know, when, when, the, when there's a blood clot inside the head, like with Jensen, the story I was telling about the accident, it puts pressure on the brain, and the, there's only so much pressure you can hold inside your skull. In this situation, because the skull was, and I don't want to get too graphic, was blown out, then the the pressure went out. And uh, I won't get too much into the details of that, but we had to get him to the OR quickly to stop the bleeding and to help, you know, you know, try to mitigate the pressure that was pushing stuff out. And so, you know, we did that, and it just happened to be in a place that was – not as important as other places, you know, uh, which is kind of hard to imagine in the brain. We have a little bit of a redundant computer in the frontal lobe. Um, uh, but, you know, basically, you know, I mean, he recovered and went through rehab and had a weak arm, but gradually got better. And, you know, his his mom and his grandmother, you know, continue to bring him into therapy. And, you know, just to follow up on that one, too, we have this amazing, uh, it's called Try My Best. It's a triathlon that they do for kids that have um, either developmental or, you know, recovery issues. They're matched with school-age kids who don't, and so they have a, a buddy. And so they'll do a, a swim if they can, and then they have assisted bikes that they use, and then they'll even have a, a run that is around a track, a couple of loops. And uh, KJ was in that uh, Try My Best triathlon, and, you know, he just – 
<laughs> he was there to win, you know. I mean, it's it's really amazing. Uh, I've, I've had the same experience with other children that I've cared for that then have recovered, and they go back to this, they come to do this race because it's a good part of recovery. And, you know, they're just all out it's, it, to win. It's just um it's just an amazing thing to see and for my kids to see too who who have been a part of that race too. So yeah, it's it's just it's resilience almost everywhere you look. I mean, it's it's this it's, it's this idea to me and I'm still kind of forming this a little bit, but it's this concept that it it it, it is this conversation that you have with families like you and I were talking about before that's kind of the worst conversation they've ever had. And then over time you can see it kind of move to this sense of community and this sense of, you know, the support that comes at a children's hospital, but from family but and from friends and also the recovery that comes and that deep sense of gratitude. And sometimes, like you said too, Marshall, like not every outcome is great. Some children die. And so then what's the role that we have? Is it to, um, you know, if, if we can't, save a child's life you know maybe it's to somehow be with the family just enough so that they understand that that they did everything that they could and yeah. that one day they will be able to look back and feel like that as awful as this was they can have you know some sense of resolution from it if that makes sense I'm, it's, it's a really complex concept um and there's a lot that brings to bear you know, right there in Jackson at the at the Children's Hospital there, there's a lot of resources to help people. But at the end of the day, it's a little bit about their faith construct if they have one. It's about family. It's about support. And it's about knowing that the decisions that they had to make at the time, in the moment, that were hard, that, that they did that in the best way that they possibly could. In the last 30 seconds we have, I could go on with the show for five more hours. This has been fantastic. Well, Where can folks I really enjoyed it? Where can folks find the book? Well, it is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm big on independent bookstores. It's right there in Lemuria. It's at Square Books. Um, it's also um, Amazon. It's at, um, if you just, you know, if you web search All That Moves Us and Wellens, they have lots of different ways to order it. I, I'm, I love, you know, I went to both those bookstores as, as a college student and as a, as a medical student, too. So independent bookstores around the, around the state and, uh, it's just, I'm so honored to have been on this show, Marshall. Thank you so much for asking. Jay, this has been great. Thank you so much. I want to thank you for listening and thank our guest, Dr. Jay Wellen, for join, joining us today. And if you'd like to hear this show again or any past episodes, you can listen on our podcast on our your favorite podcast app or on our MPB public media app. Now You're Talking is a production of MPB Think Radio. It's produced by the incredible Jermaine Flood. Join us next week at 10 a.m. for another great conversation here on MPB Think Radio. Y'all have a great week. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB 